Hello, welcome everybody to another event within the UNIDO webinar series on quality and standards in the fight against COVID-19. My name is Dorina Nati and I'm here with uh, six very renowned panelists. For all of those who have missed our previous sessions, we're pleased to announce that um, the recordings of all the previous webinars are now available online. For more information, please go to Trade Investment and Innovation Knowledge Hub um, and follow the link tii.unido.org. As you can see, we already had a number of very interesting panels with um, very interesting speakers. So if you, if you think that um, they're interesting, then please um, go to the website and have a link, uh, look at the recordings which are now available for everybody. Um, having said that, today's uh, session will focus on personal protective equipment, a topic that has become particularly relevant in the past couple of weeks. Today we will discuss the challenges related to standardization and how we can overcome those challenges uh, in view of global availability and supply. Um, thank you all for being here with us today. We have six panelists and the session will be moderated by Mr. Bernardo Calzadilla Sarmiento, who will also be giving some introductory remarks at the beginning. We will then follow with the panel discussion, um, where the panelists will have the possibility to give their insights, and um, we will conclude with a Q&A session. For the question and answers for all the attendees that would like to pose a question, please do so by entering your question in writing at the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will uh, have a look and filter all the questions that come in. Unfortunately, um, due to time constraints, we might not be able to answer all your questions. We want to apologize in advance if this is the case. However, we will do our best to um, select the most relevant questions and ask them to the panelists after the panel discussion. Um, I, I also want to say that today we're making full use of the technology available. So the session will be recorded and um, the recordings and the slides will be made available after the session. Again, for that, please always refer to the TII Knowledge Hub, tii.unido.org. And having said that, from my side, I would like to hand over to Mr. Bernardo Calzadilla Sarmiento, the Director of the Department of Trade Investment and Innovation at the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Bernardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, we are so happy to, to have this second virtual panel discussion um, that was uh, uh, organized in the framework of the, our uh, work on quality and standards. But before we uh, go to uh, uh, our discussion, uh, I would really sincerely thanks the, the, the availability of our panelists today that are here today. We have colleagues from all over the, the world, from uh, Canada on the one side of the world to China. We are in Europe, in Geneva, in Brussels, and also in Cote d'Ivoire, in Abidjan. So we have a widespread uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 panelists uh, being uh, located all over. So uh, let me briefly introduce our, our panelists. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mr. Gidiu, he's professor associated in Beijing Municipal Institute of Labor Protection and has been working for many years in relation to standardization of personal uh, protective equipment, including uh, uh, protective coding uh, respirators and has served as a member of the Chinese National Technical Committee. So very much into what we want to bring this uh, conversation through. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Adriana. Uh, uh, Ms. Adriana Velasquez is joining us. Thank you for making available uh, your, your time. We know you are very busy these days. Joining us also from the WHO, I think you are in Geneva, uh, and uh, you are working at the Health Product Policy and Standards Department access to medicines and health products division. And you have been working more than 30 years in biomedical engineering uh, and also working with uh, vitro diagnostics at WHO uh, and also coordinating medical uh, devices, technical series, publications, 
it, uh, Adriana has uh, a background in biomedical engineering and uh, clinical engineering postgraduate studies. Uh, has been also very much engaged in uh, the uh, National Center of Health Technology uh, Excellence and Attack at the Ministry of Health in Mexico, where she was the Director General. We have uh, with uh, her, Ms. Yingding from uh, WPO, who will stay with us for the duration of the, of the panel. Thank you very much. You are joining us from, from Canada. I understand from East Canada. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, you are a biomedical engineer from the University of Toronto, uh, specializing in human factors and expert decision support systems. Uh, and you have been very active in uh, 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 providing technical specification, working in uh, developing guides, especially during the Ebola outbreak. Uh, thank you so much to be, uh, for being with us uh, today. Ms. Silvia Vaccaro, Policy Officer at the uh, uh, European Union, uh, has a background on uh, engineering from the Politecnico de Milano uh, and master degree in international relations. I remember the times we met uh, uh, at Sen, uh, and I was with, with ICE, but uh, long collaboration with Nido. Thanks so much uh, to being with us today. I know that through the UNEC, we have been collaborating also very much together. Uh, Lorenzia Yahya, uh, and I just say Lorenzia. Lorenza, thank you for being with us. We have also been working together for many years. Uh, in your capacity as Secretary of the Regulatory Cooperation and Standardization Working Group, working part in number six at the UNEC. And uh, you have been, uh, as a matter of fact, spearheading this excellent work on gender responsive uh, standards uh, initiative, the declaration that is really trying to push forward the implementation of SDG 5. But also we have uh, several other axes of collaboration, especially in risk management, also in other areas where is, uh, that is very relevant today. And finally, we would like to introduce uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Marcel uh, Wabidi. Uh, bonjour, Marcel. Uh, he is the Director General of the West African Accreditation System. Uh, he's from Senegal, but living in Abidjan and he is specialized in international trade uh, quality management. He is a, a laboratory expert and has been working also with WHO, uh, with French Development Agency, uh, UNIDO, ITC, and uh, he has been accompanying for many years the implementation of the West African Quality Infrastructure Development Program. So having then uh, introduced the, the speakers, so uh, let me approach to, to, to the topic. I think like many of the audience and myself, we heard this word PPE uh, 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 only um, during the outbreak of, uh, of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, personal protective equipment coming from Bolivia, coming from a country with a strong mining industry, uh, protection was always a helmet. And now we see uh, we are talking about a, a different uh, uh, protective equipment. It's, it's, it's gloves, uh, it, it's masks, it's, it's, it's a glue, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, protection for the body. And all this uh, has suddenly uh, entered our uh, jargon. It is day by day that we read it in the press, and it has become so prominent. It has become so prominent from day one of the outbreak, has become uh, uh, prominent because of this big problem, which is the lack of uh, 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 matching of the demand that has grown exponentially from one day to another and the capacity to supply. And uh, I think that uh, what is interesting is that we have been confronted with a lot of information, with figures, uh, also with a lot of uh, 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 information about what is going on, uh, flights uh, going all over the world, trying to bring uh, these goods to the countries. And uh, we have been uh, certainly looking at the importance of, of, of how to meet the supply, but also how to meet the quality and the standards. So uh, let's look at some figures. 
Yes, let's look at some figures. Well, what we have prepared for you today are some questions um, on the relevance and the magnitude of the use of PPE these days. PPE is an abbreviation which I personally have hardly used before, the times of COVID. So it is um, something new to all of us. And what we um, have prepared a short poll for you you will soon see a question on your screen and you will be able to click on the correct answer or what you think is the correct answer. Please, there is no right or wrong. This is rather for you to give a guess and for us to get an idea of um, the magnitude or how or about the use of PPE these days. So the first question for you is, on average, how many examination gloves have been used per month since the outbreak of COVID-19? Is it 10 million, 23 million, 58 million, 76 million, or 90 million? Please, you are, will be able to click on the correct answer or whatever you think is the correct answer. I'll give you, let's say, 15 more seconds to do so. I see the answers are coming in. It's very interesting. So please participate in the poll. It's only fun if everybody does it. Good, very good. Five more seconds. And I will end the poll now. Good, very interesting. I will show you the results of the poll. So most of you think it is 90 million. Actually, the monthly use of uh, examination gloves per month, this figure is per month, is 76 million. So 76 million gloves have been used every month since the outbreak of COVID-19 on average, and the figure is worldwide. But your guess is not bad. We have another question for you. So let's continue. The question is, how many surgical face masks will be required until the end of 2020? So what do you think? You will be able to give your votes now, I will give you 20 seconds to do so. So you have a little bit of time to think, but don't think too much. This is for us to get an idea. Certainly the use of surgical masks have increased, has increased tremendously, particularly as many countries are requiring the use of surgical masks or of, of face masks in public spaces. So I'll give you five more seconds, but I think most of you have made up their mind yet. So I will end the poll now. Your guess again is very high, six billion. That's a tremendously high figure. Actually, um, the estimate is 2.2 billion face masks until the end of the year 2020. So we have one more, which will be, sorry, here you can see the results of the survey. So 40% um, think it's 6 billion and 24%, 29 of you have chosen the correct answer, which is 2.2 billion. And we have one last question for you, which relates to the increase in production. So to meet the raising global demand of PPE around the world, what do you think? How much um, will the manufacturing need to increase in percent? Is it 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50? I will again give you a couple of seconds to reply. 15 more seconds. Please put your answer by clicking on it. I'll give you a little bit more time, five seconds from now. All right, I end the poll and these are the results. The correct answer is 40%. It is estimated that manufacturing will have to increase by 40% for PPE. These are, so what I can see from your 
from your um, answer is that you already are aware that certainly there will be an increased demand and we will have to produce and use much more PPE. And this is precisely one of the reasons we're having the discussion today. We think it's a very relevant topic. Thank you all for giving your, um, your guesses to our poll. And with that, I hand over to um, Bernardo, who will introduce the topic in more detail. Bernardo? Bernardo, we cannot hear uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this was very interesting. And this only shows uh, that uh, demand uh, and uh, the need uh, go into astronomic figures. I really don't uh, know what to fi figures uh, to believe. I was reading in The Economist that it, w it will depend also how do you measure. If you follow the UK regulation, they were saying you need to change the gloves after each patient. So this will be another size we, you will get. Uh, and uh, each, each time you, we, we, we read about these figures, we have uh, these 89 million medical masks that are required, 76 billion of gloves per month, or 1.6 million Googles there, uh, per month. There will be a dramatic increase, this is no doubt. And what is also very clear is that we will have and maintain uh, this astronomic, I call them astronomic uh, uh, figures that, uh, in which we are confronted. But in this, uh, uh, we have uh, witnessed this, uh, this match of uh, and, and, uh, uh, demand and supply. And uh, what is important to see is that the glue to bring together the demand to the supply is also the quality. Because in whatever we have been reading also in the press, which I would say we have uh, some facts, some figures, but there was also a lot of fake news, uh, is that we need to look also into quality. Uh, and quality is fundamental to make uh, this uh, trade happen. And this is what we want to talk today, is how uh, standardization, conformity assessment, and compliance uh, with those are helping to meet this demand. But also what is important is to uh, see how um, uh, we can uh, be sure that uh, uh, this will help. So today we are going to uh, basically look at, uh, next slide please, how to ensure the, that PPP is safe. And I would really like to bring you to, to, to more concrete, uh, 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 qualitative type of thinking, which is the characteristics of these uh, PPEs, which is related now to fluid resistance, leak protection, filtering capacity, so these are very concrete characteristics which have to be looked at and we will certainly hear more during the uh, discussion. But before we enter the, 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 the more technical part of our discussion, I would like to leave the floor for the first round to our panelists and ask them all the same questions. What would be from their uh, perspective, uh, what they have learned, uh, what they have observed in terms of the challenges in relation to quality, to standards, to conformity assessment, that will help them to have all these PPE products available in the context. What did we learn in the context of this COVID-19 pandemic? So with that, I would like the floor, uh, give the floor to Mr. Liu. Mr. Liu, please. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, um, uh, for, from my point of view, uh, from my point of view, I think that if we want to ensure the quantity and availability of PPEs products in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we first have to promote the acceptance of PPEs that that uh, in that we have to accept them based on their performances. Um, um, uh, in my uh, in my in my own experiences, that during our Chinese. Uh, during our Chinese early stage of uh, the the coronavirus uh, crisis, we don't have enough uh, medical face masks. So, um, but um, but we have examined the uh, products such as uh, uh, face masks that it was used for the industrial, uh, uh, which means that we can and they are used for the coal miners, for the painters, and for other uh, for the uh, for uh, the for others that was used. 
and as uh, because they have uh, in a, uh, they have a uh, adequate uh, protect uh, protectability against uh, um, uh, particles uh, that have the similar size or even smaller size uh, than the coronavirus, they can be used to protect against the such uh, uh, diseases, uh, such viruses. And the uh, the second part, I think, is to facilitate the international trade of PPEs, because you know that during the early stage of uh, the, the breakout of the disease, China have purchased PPEs and also received a lot of donations from other countries. Also, uh, not all of these PPEs meet the requirements, uh, meet the requirements of our standards of medical uh, face masks, but um, they have a lot uh, during our uh, during our uh, uh, they have a lot uh, they have us a lot uh, to protect our uh, nurses doctors to uh, to uh, fight against such uh, crisis. So yeah, uh, this is basically to my in my two points of uh, uh, how we can deal with uh, such uh, crisis during the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, thank you so much, and certainly for us, it's very interesting to learn uh, from from your experience in in China. Uh, let me move on and and, and give the floor to Adriana. Uh, Adriana, uh, thanks for joining. We know you are very very busy, and um, uh, uh, we are very keen to listen to you. What's the takeaway from your side? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bernardo, and thank you on uh, the invitation of UNIDO to be with you today. So Ying and I are very happy to be here. Uh, well, I think the, the main issue that we have to concern is that uh, PPE, exactly as you say, Bernardo, it, it was used for industrial. So it was the, it is basically, the, the protective equipment was used for the industry, like the chemical industry, construction industry, other industries. And so it, a little niche was for health. Of course, the masks, we have been, that is like the first medical device that has ever been because masks are used since a uh, hundred years ago. But uh, now we have to change from being industrial to really, really uh, have our main concerns on the quality um, safety, effectiveness, appropriateness, uh, affordability also, and even acceptability by the users on the, in the health sector. And then in the health sector, we have like three big areas. One is the healthcare worker. We need to protect our healthcare workers so that they can get infected so that they can take care of more patients. But now we also in this uh, COVID uh, situation, and it happened when it was in SARS, and then it happened uh, uh, in, in Ebola also, but now when there are these respiratory diseases, then the main uh, issue of contamination is through the mouth and, and nose. So then we have to protect patients, but we have to protect the community. So now it seems that the, the, everybody is now having to wear a mask. It is not just the healthcare workers, but also the community and the patients to uh, protect and they do not contaminate the others. So uh, even though now uh, we're wearing the, the, the masks, uh, the face shields, now there is a lot of innovations and maybe we can have a reuse of them and uh, reusable uh, products. But uh, the, the main thing that is really worrisome is that uh, most of these standards were made considering the industrial part, not really the, 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 or the biochemical part and chemistry and pharmaceutical. But now we really have to face on the, on the, on the, on the part of the medical and, and healthcare workers. Uh, the second issue that is very important is um, most of the people that uh, decide and, and, and make these standards are not uh, having a worldwide representation. It is uh, mostly high income countries, mostly the industry that is doing the standards. So how can we really encourage other, other voices to be able to provide information about how standards should be made and uh, this, the certification, the standards uh, of the products. So um, I think uh, we are in a, in a difficult situation. WHO has been producing standards and uh, regulations and standards for pharmaceuticals, for vaccines, but not really for medical devices, not really for protective equipment. So now this is a very important area in which we have to uh, participate as WHO and we are providing technical specifications and we are working with the industry now with our international organizations. So we're very happy 
uh, to have the possibility of work with UNIDO to, to make sure that uh, whatever is either uh, locally produced or uh, give guidance to local product production and also for the production uh, globally that we could have uh, better uh, standards and um, uh, quality assurance and, and uh, uh, verification and testing for all these um, what we call medical devices. No, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, Adriana, indeed, uh, we, we have a lot of, of work to do together. Thank you so much. And for us also, we, we, we know very much WHO from the food safety area, uh, from the good laboratory practice. But this is also a new area where we at UNIDO feel that we can contribute. We have been collaborating with uh, WHO for many years uh, in relation to local uh, pharmaceutical production. So we have a long history. We have been uh, contributing through the codex. We have been converging. So we have a number of entry points where we have been collaborating. But as I said at the beginning, I think we, we, we are facing here a new situation, not that only COVID will lead us to this new normal, but we will really go to a new situation. And, uh, I, I, I very much appreciate uh, your sensitivity about how can we ensure that developing countries take part in the standards because Yes, the high end for the technological medical products, we have good standards and we have uh, many good standardization bodies, but what we need is to, to think for uh, the, 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 the communities and all this. So thanks so much for, for your insight. Uh, and I know you, you will leave us, but uh, your colleague in Lin will, will continue the discussion with us. Thank you so much, Adriana, and we will keep in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, and thank you. He will continue. Looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Uh, and and, and, and uh, le le let's continue with with, with Silvia. Silvia, uh, uh, you has uh, from the outset been become very prominent because we have heard a number of policy decisions. Uh, the most positive was that immediately you freed uh, you worked, I think, together with Sanzanek to to get the standards for free. But there is much more behind. So please. Uh, tell us your take. You're muted. Sorry, uh, I, I'm, I, I, was, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> I was saying that I will, I will give more details in my presentation later on, but uh, I think we can, we can have uh, three main conclusions out of this crisis. The first one is that no one was adequately prepared, no one in, nowhere in the world. The second one is that the world is now a place that's really interconnected. So something that uh, starts in one side of the world within three weeks, uh, goes on the other side and there's no way to stop it. And uh, what we saw in the EU, uh, first of all, the European Commission does not have any competence in terms of health. So the health is, a, is still a competence of the member states. And what we noticed as soon as the crisis began was that all the member states sort of as a knee-jerk reaction tried to protect their own. They didn't think about the union, they didn't think about anything else, they just thought about their own, uh, their own country. And of course, this created some problems within the internal market. So our first uh, task actually was really my directorate, uh, was to try to uh, keep the, the free movement of goods flowing, especially for goods that were uh, important for, uh, for the crisis. And for that, we created some green corridors uh, to allow the, the exchange of, uh, of merchandise from one member state to the other. And I must say, this is working very well. And, uh, and also a lesson that we should probably learn is that the moment that the European Union started uh, sort of centralizing all the requests for, uh, for PPE, uh, for purchase. Of course, the conditions became better and it was, it was also more e easier for member states to get, uh, to get what they needed. Uh, so again, uh, well above my pay grade, but maybe one lesson will be to see if uh, also for health uh, issues, uh, there should be a movement towards a more uh, community-based approach rather than uh, the national approach. But as I said, well above my pay grade, so I'm not... <laughs> I'm not speculating on this. Another thing I wanted to point out uh, is that 
what we call PPE in Europe is actually PPE, medical devices, in vitro. So they are all covered mm. by a little bit different, different, uh, different things. And actually the standards that were made available for free, and I will discuss it a little bit more later, were actually on PPE, but also uh, mostly on medical devices. So in Europe, basically, uh, personal protective equipment is for everyone. Uh, and uh, especially in this case, uh, all the FFP uh, protection masks are covered by the PPE, as are uh, the, um, the worker wear protections and, the, uh, and the other things that are not particularly used only in hospital. While on the other hand, we have medical devices and these are really only to be used in, uh, in, um, in a medical context, including, for example, surgical masks, uh, medical gloves, uh, intensive care, and other, and other equipment that is used only for, uh, in, a, in a hospital context. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, this remark, Silvia. And let's move on uh, listening to our other panelists, uh, Lorenza, we give you the floor. Thank you, uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar series and uh, for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I would like to make uh, two broad points now in the introduction. The first one is about information and the second one is about cooperation. And uh, as regards information, I think we've uh, witnessed how much it is important to give firms and also administrations access to information on the relevant guidelines for them to adapt their production facilities and for them to ramp up production to meet the demand that we have before us. So uh, firms, administration need access to standards. They also need access to information that helps them identify which are the right standards. And that's something that I find is a really good example of why standards matter for the Sustainable Development Goals. And in particular here, of course, we're talking about SDG3, so health. And, uh, uh, but the same is true for all of the SDGs. Uh, without standards, we cannot achieve any of the 17 SDGs. And that's why our organization, UNECE, has built a portal, which is called Standards for the SDGs, which allows the identification of standards that allow uh, the, um, the achievement of the goals and targets of Agenda 2030. And the second point I wanted to make is about cooperation. And I'm sure we will touch uh, this point uh, also later on. Uh, but here it is so important for countries to continue and, and uh, Silvia referred to this at the European level, but it's really global. We need to continue to work together. One concrete example, and I think that the standards world as always has been so general, and, uh, so generous and so cooperative. And we would like to see the same in other <laughs> areas of the world, uh, the same cooperation and, and uh, harmonization spirit. But just to give you a couple examples here, I read uh, that the Spanish uh, Ministry of Industry has allowed uh, to access on the market uh, 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 products that uh, do not just comply with harmonized standards, but also products that comply with uh, American standards, with Chinese standards, with standards from Australia, uh, Canada, Japan, and finally has even given uh, uh, discretion to the accreditation body for allowing on the market other products from even more jurisdictions. So this is the kind of cooperation we'd like to see. And as well, the same was in the United States where we saw the same, the uh, approval of use of respirators that uh, uh, were uh, conforming to different standards, including Chinese standards, for example, as well as European standards. So uh, I think I'll stop here and look forward to discussing further with colleagues. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you, Lorenza. Indeed, uh, the cooperation uh, and, and the SDGs is, is, is of big concern. I, I think the, the, the COVID uh, uh, is setting back uh, our drive to, to achieve the, the uh, uh, SDGs in, in a way nobody could have imagined. Uh, we, we, we will 
have not touched today about the whole economic implication, the disruption of the value chains, and all what it means uh, that we will need to invest in, in recovery. Uh, it, it will be tremendous. But still, uh, I, I agree with you that we still have this framework, the development framework, the sustainable development framework that can help us to guide and continue guiding our joint actions. Thank you so much, Lorenz. And with that, I move to Marcel. Marcel, uh, we need to, to hear the voice of Africa. We need to hear uh, what is uh, uh, coming from your side of the world, but also uh, as the head and the director general of the accreditation body, uh, uh, SOAC, uh, we also would like uh, to hear more of one specific element, which is conformity assessment. Thank you so much, Bernardo, for the invitation and for this uh, very interesting webinar. I think that uh, from my point of view, I would like to stress the fact that because of the sh shortage of the demand uh, of, the, of the PPEs, or specifically of masks, we have not that uh, we have a new need uh, of, local, uh, of local tailors, of handcraft tailors, uh, specific, specifically in West Africa. Because you know that it is quite difficult now to be able to have uh, uh, PPEs coming from uh, abroad. So it means that in, uh, in Africa, we need to find new way to train our local uh, industry and all these very small uh, enterprises. And I think that by the past, we have some very supportive uh, program to support these very small uh, companies. But because of this pandemic, uh, it's uh, very more important now to be able to rely on these, uh, on these specific uh, very small uh, companies, and this is very challenging. So it means that we need cooperation in training, we need cooperation uh, with all the international uh, companies, but at the same time, we need to uh, be able to have a good level of training for these people. Some of them uh, are not so well educated, I would say. So it means that how Africa should, uh, should take into account the fact that now, we, more, uh, we, we need to rely on uh, our, our, our local industry. The, the, the second point uh, uh, is the, the fact that uh, we see that uh, now the quality and infrastructure, uh, specifically in West Africa, is very important because by the past, you know, we were working on the lab, laboratory policy and so on, and we need that. Uh, it was not so known by the authorities, but now, uh, with this pandemic, you see that in the, uh, in the, in the ministries, in the, in the private sector, everybody is interested in, in quality. And I think that it is very good for the, 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 the promotion of quality infrastructure and the promotion of, of, of uh, uh, conformity assessment mechanism. So I think that uh, uh, with the cooperation that have been developed between the, the countries and between the region, uh, it's, it's allowed now to to have a better understanding of the needs of all this, this uh, support to the uh, conformity assessment. And uh, this is the, the two big points. But I think that in my presentation, I can go uh, ahead and give more explanation of the challenge. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. And you, you are touching also on this very important element, which is cooperation. Cooperation eventually more at the regional level, but it seems that this is a, a, a very, very key element for uh, moving forward. And um, uh, yes, I see that uh, we are already moving into the next phase. I would like to, to, to ask to uh, uh, Mr. Liu uh, uh, if he can give us a picture on what are the common denominator of those main divergences in PPE standards between the three main producers. I think Lorenza made reference about that, but also uh, Adriana about uh, the different uh, uh, and divergence of uh, uh, standards uh, at the regional, local, international level, but also from different standardization bodies. ASTM has very famous uh, bodies, ISO, Sentinelec. So uh, please, uh, what's your take on this issue of the different type of standards? The floor is yours, Mr. Liu. Uh, yeah, first, uh, uh, first, uh, I, I think maybe ne next page will be uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, uh, so you say that in the? Uh, can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Uh, so, so you say that. Uh, so, uh, so you say that on the on the right there's a there's a table which was given by our national 
uh, health uh, committee uh, to guide our uh, to to guide the citizens on how to use the PPEs to protect ourselves against the coronavirus. Um, and we can see that uh, from from the uh, from the up to the bottom, there's uh, and there's uh, lower risk levels, which means that on the highest uh, on the on the high of the, uh, on the high of the table, the risk is quite uh, is quite high, which including the cervicals and do, doing the cut cut of the throat. And uh, and at the lower part of this uh, this table, there's uh, there's a, a quite sim uh, there's a quite a low risk. Uh, uh, scenarios, which including just working around uh, uh, in your committees and also go to school or go to the the buses, and uh, from the left uh, and uh, from the left to right, there's uh, there's the uh, 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 corresponding face masks that can be used to uh, give us uh, suffice uh, uh, protect our abilities against uh, uh, against the such risk against the risk at such uh, levels. Uh, we can see that as a high risk, there uh, we we have to use uh, uh, face masks that provide us with uh, higher uh, with uh, pro, pro, with higher pro performances, and that at uh, at, at uh, scenarios with very low low risk, we we even don't have to wear the face masks. So uh, first, uh, uh, give uh, uh, and so this is first a uh, little guidance, so that as we know that we are on a world shortage of such face masks. So uh, if we can divide uh, divide uh, uh, scenarios and choose different uh, face masks uh, according to the scenario, we may uh, save a lot of uh, uh, productivity so that we can we can uh, keep better materials for the higher level of uh, face masks used uh, to uh, use uh, uh, that can that we can supply them to uh, to the doctors or the nurses or the medicals that can uh, that has that works at high risk areas, and the next slide, the next page, please. Yeah. Uh, so first, uh, uh, to introduce uh, to introduce the standards, uh, there may be some uh, base, uh, there may be some technical concepts. Uh, here I divided the requirements of uh, uh, the technical requirements of uh, face mask uh, into four categories. Uh, first and most important is the protective uh, the protective properties, which including the filtering efficiency, and uh, the total inward leakage and the splash resistance, and the uh, the second part is the material safety, which defines that we uh, we have to make sure that the material that was used to construct the face masks would not bring any uh, harm to the uh, wearers. And the third part of the and the third part is the comfort, which mainly about the breathing resistance. As uh, the breathing resistance is the uh, actual is the addictive burden that uh, introduced by the mask to our breathing uh, processes. The higher breathing resistance is the more difficult we uh, would the more difficult we will breathe when we using the face mask. And the and the last part is the other other requirements of the other requirements including the marking and the information supplied by the suppliers. Basically, all the uh, all the product standards uh, referring to the face mask can be divided into uh, the technical requirements of the of a product standard can be divided into these four categories. And uh, to to better illustrate the uh, to better illustrate, uh, to better compare, uh, comparing the standards, I uh, divide, I, I use a triangle map to to show what different uh, uh, kind of products can be uh, can be uh, can be can be shown. So the next slide, please. Next page. Yeah. Uh, the first and. Uh, 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 this then, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this page uh, demonstrates the, uh, yeah, 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 okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you, you should uh, uh, refer to the uh, la uh, last, so that we can remove the figure. The backward, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, ba uh, so basically there, uh, so basically here I demonstrate the two standards, one is GB, uh, 19, 1906, uh, 83, 
which is a technical requirements of protecting face masks for medical use. That is uh, what we use for the uh, for 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 the nurses or the uh, uh, the medical workers as high risk uh, uh, scenarios. And the other part is the uh, EN uh, uh, 149, which is quite familiar, uh, which uh, Miss uh, Miss William may quite familiar because it's a face mask pro uh, uh, a face mask product standard for the uh, for the uh, industrial. It is uh, re respir respirator protected devices, filtering half mask to protect against particles. Um, uh, and and below uh, below is a table that I can I comparing the uh, the performance levels of these two uh, two standards. We can see that they all almost have an identical performance. Uh, uh, first, from the filter efficiency, we can see that the the GB standard, the filter efficiency should be higher than uh, 19, uh, 19 five percent, and for the uh, for the in standard. Uh, we can we can get, we get an uh, filter efficiency of about uh, from eight percent from eighty percent to ninety nine percent. Okay, from the uh, from the fitness factors that was used to describe the inward leakage when wearing the face mask, we can we can see that they almost the uh, the GB standard is a little bit higher than the. Uh, face mask uh, than the than the in standard, and uh, and uh, and there are other technical requirements, including the material safety and the comfort. Uh, uh, and the, at the bottom, there's a triangle map showing that we uh, showing that the basic performance uh, performance um, performance levels, uh, which uh, which, show, uh, which which it has three dimensions, including the protection, the comfort, and the safety. The protection is uh, a quad code because the full score may be uh, about 1.0, and they all they, they have the pro uh, performance about uh, 0 0.8, and uh, from the comfort level they are a little bit uh, lower from uh, from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, and uh, then we can go to the next slide. Yeah, next page. Yeah, this uh, this slide showing the uh, showing uh, showing, uh, showing the comparison of two standards, including the EN uh, uh, 14.6.18.3, the medical face masks requirements and technical methods. That was a uh, uh, EN standard that was used to describe uh, that was used to regulate the face mask used for medical, and also we have the. Uh, one standards that is a medical uh, medical standard used in our country for the surgical mask and and uh, by comparing this uh, we can say that first uh, <coughs> uh, the and the two products have a uh, filter efficiency and the bacteria filtration uh, filtration efficiency we have to emphasize here that uh, the bacteria filter efficiency uh, according to our test and according to the samples that we have gathered in China, uh, they are quite uh, they are quite related. That uh, that we all we always have a, a filter efficiency number. Uh, that 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 is if we have a quite good filter efficiency, we must uh, we could definitely have a quite well bacterial filtration efficiency. And. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, and after that is uh, material safety and the comfort. We can say that uh, this kind of influx may have a uh, quite good uh, comfort, but uh, but for the uh, but as we uh, mentioned about the protect protection performances, uh, it's it's a little bit lower than that of the previous kind of products, which uh, which is coordinated to. Our uh, our government guidelines for the selection of the face masks, uh, you uh, for the selection of face masks used at the uh, higher risk levels. And the next slide, please. Okay, uh, there's uh, just a demonstration of this. And uh, as a and uh, and here's uh, another kind of uh, product that's used uh, that will use the, for the higher for the highest uh, risk levels. And that is the full face masks and the half and quarter face masks. 
uh, we have to say that they have the best protective uh, protective properties, which can be seen by the number of the uh, in the leakage. Uh, for the full face mass, it, its number is 0 0.05%. And for the half and quarter face mask, it's uh, lower, uh, the number is a little bit uh, larger. Uh, that is to uh, 2% uh, when, 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 when calculated by each of two individual wearers at the uh, mean average of the uh, in order leakage. And, and uh, on the right is uh, uh, a triangular map of this uh, of of, its, of of this kind of product, which means that it it has a highest protection level and a little bit lower safety. Uh, so by uh, by comparing these three kinds of uh, three categories of products, we can see that uh, they have different names. For for example, the industrial respirators. For the medical surf, uh, for the medical face masks, and uh, for the half and uh, uh, half quarter of the full face masks used the, um, in the and uh, at other uh, scenarios, but they have similar technical requirements. Uh, called when we when we uh, when we say that they ha we have to test the, their filter efficiency, uh, the total uh, in water leakage of the fitness factors or. Uh, we have to we have to evaluate their uh, practical performances. We have to uh, check that uh, check that if they have a, a skin a skin irritation or the uh, let's say the skin irritation or the worry uh, or the virtual uh, or the or the cleanliness of this. So. So, uh, so we, uh, so we, we have to say that so they have different uh, names, or maybe they, uh, for, they were first designed to serve different purpose. But we have to say that as long as, uh, uh, as long as, uh, if we evaluate evaluate their pro protective properties, and uh, by the and uh, by their testing method, we have to say that. Uh, they are quite common uh, for the uh, for use to protect against the coronavirus. That that you can use industrial face mask to uh, uh, to serve the purpose, and you can you can also use uh, 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 medical face masks. Yeah. So that's uh, I think that's all. That's all of my presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Liu. Uh, this was very interesting, especially showing uh, for the medical uh, uh, de de devices, the, 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 the standards that are used, and while there are differences, how uh, uh, elaborated the standards are. Uh, in the meantime, I, I, I was distracted also looking at, at the QA and A's, and I see that a lot of questions uh, from the participants are more worried about the daily use and community that is going on there. Uh, we will get back to the questions later. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much. We will um, listen to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ying Ding from the WHO, and uh, she will also, from that uh, angle, uh, provide us, an, I hope, a, 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 an idea what is the contribution from WHO in standards harmonization in addressing uh, regulatory uh, uh, issues. Uh, so with that, uh, Ms. Yingling, the floor is yours. Okay, hi everybody. Um, can everyone hear me well? Yes. Okay, I, hear, I see nodding. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your time and um, the invitation to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, so I'll give the perspective of um, the operation support and logistics uh, challenges experienced with PPE procurement as it relates to standards and regulatory clearances, um, as well as how the WHO has been contributing to um, uh, kind of solving in this pandemic situation those challenges. So um, we'll just go to the next slide, please. Uh, so, um, as discussed, and um, <laughs> and the setting for all this is really the issue with uh, the large pr volume procurement that, that we're facing, um, and also the competition for that limited global supply. 
Um, and uh, one of the challenges that we've uh, noticed is that there's no global regulatory um, body for these items. Um, and it, and uh, as a repercussion of this is that there's no post-market surveillance. These exist, of course, in countries and um, uh, regions that, that can easily recall when there's a defect or manufacturers can push notifications to um, uh, uh, alarm, I guess, um, issues with uh, detected failures of uh, PPE in the supply chain. And so this has been a real issue for us because WHO is procuring for several um, UN agencies as well as uh, ministries of health uh, where um, um, it's just more difficult for, for other countries to access this limited supply. So um, that's a real challenge right now. Um, there's also, as uh, Professor Liu uh, very clearly demonstrated, that there is um, differences in the PP standards. So um, they're linked to the regions. Um, we would like that ISO would have like a single standard to, to guide us. Um, but really, uh, there are some test methods that are sometimes referenced, but not consistently across those regional and national um, standards. So uh, we've had to take shortcuts and for our checks on performance of uh, potentially procured PPE, we, we select the most relevant standards and boil it down to um, what uh, Professor Liu was, um, was showing as, as being more of the common tests um, that can be applied uh, across similar items such as respirators or masks um, and, uh, and just trying to get some consistency in our global uh, supply. Um, there's also issues with uh, class one medical devices. Um, in some jurisdictions, these are self-certifying, self-labeling. This means that um, there's less oversight. Um, there may, there, um, because um, it's self-certifying, we have to kind of assume in some cases there's a, a robust QMS system, but sometimes that's not necessary for the class one medical devices, and maybe that's something to, to discuss in this forum. Um, there's also uh, some low-cost PPE items such as disposable aprons, even the heavy-duty aprons um, and disposable face shields that are not quite meeting any uh, specific standard just because they're disposable. But these are the ones that we're trying to procure just because in the pandemic situation, that's what's most easily produced. Um, and we also have issues with um, the certificates that we uh, receive. Sometimes they're not full test reports. Sometimes they're low quality resolution um, and, um, and of course they're tied to those um, region specific uh, regulatory bodies. And um, we also are uh, encountering um, supplies from new factors which have not had experience with PPE. They may be, ha they might have produced electrical equipment and are producing uh, new PPE um, because they have access to the plastics and, and raw materials that um, can make them. And they, they may still uh, produce high quality products, but we must test um, prior to accepting. So we've had to do a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, the work that usually established manufacturers have already done themselves if they have been uh, producing for several years. And we rely very much on um, third-party testing capacity. Uh, we have preferred labs through which we have very good test reports. Um, but this is also a limited, um, a limited resource uh, just because uh, we know that our preferred labs are overloaded. Uh, they're now switching from eight-hour uh, lab testing to 24-hour cycles. So they're switching that to like three eight hour shifts um, and they also still have a backlog. So those are some of the challenges we've, we've ex encountered with uh, PPE procurement in this context. Next slide, please. So uh, in meeting um, uh, kind of a hard, uh, ad hoc standardization uh, or harmonization of the standards, uh, we actively update the uh, disease commodity package uh, for COVID-19. There's a technical description in words uh, because sometimes, uh, for example, a, uh, an item may pass the test, but um, other uh, metrics such as comfort, breathe it, comfort, let's say, um, it's not a measured metric that's included in the standards. So we know that there's water vapor transmission, other 
standards that are um, test methods, let's say, that are defined, but they're not included in the parent standard. Um, and this is what we've encountered with Ebola as well. So for coveralls, much of the issues with coveralls when they were sent to uh, West Africa was that it's high humid, high temperature conditions. So it was very important to have a balance between permeability or fluid resistance and um, breathability. So we asked um, for uh, one of the metrics to be included, but it's outside of the standard. And so this is where we need to balance and really understand what technical stand, uh, standard test methods are available and how we can ensure that um, finally the end user will be able to use this uh, comfortably and without um, danger to their, uh, during their shift. Um, so for example, um, because uh, breathability was not built in, um, the very impermeable coveralls were used in the field and, and clinicians were uh, fainting. So um, there's a need to, to really, um, as Adriana mentioned, really look at those PPE standards and see how they should be applied and modified for healthcare settings. Um, and so in this DCP, we also reference standards um, and if possible, large um, regulatory bodies that, um, that usually uh, clear many of the items. Um, so that's a, so that's another option. I think um, we are actively trying to find and understand equivalency in the standards. So we boil it down to the test methods and performance levels. And um, we also uh, participate in rapid research projects to give evidence to uh, the rational use of PPE. So for example, there's the demand study that's um, with 12 different agencies, including universities, for the decontamination of the high quality um, N95 and, and um, disposable masks made of uh, non-woven materials, and which have very good breathability as well as filtration. Um, and so we also uh, regular, regularly update other documents that, that help um, minimize the, the need or demand for um, the disposable traditional PPE items. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your insight. And really, we, we, we can feel uh, through uh, the way you describe the, 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 the working in, in the labs, uh, how challenges, uh, challenging this, this period uh, is for, for you at WHO, all, 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 all the work that comes, but also the role, the important role that you can play to help us to uh, cope with this pandemic. And um, Again, uh, thank you, WHO, to join, uh, for joining us in this uh, in, uh, important discussion. We want to move to listen to what the EU uh, will tell us. Uh, so, uh, Sylvia, don't forget your mic. Uh, what efforts have you taken in the, in the uh, EU? And we discussed uh, about that a, a little bit uh, uh, with respect to standards and conformity assessment uh, uh, to, to market surveillance. How can this action at this moment also uh, help to, 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 to pass over the crisis so that the supply uh, make, uh, uh, we, we get is fit for purpose in this uh, uh, world of the PPEs? Uh, Sylvia, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, as I said, uh, I think I will, I will give a very quick introduction. You can put to the, the first slide if you want. Um, yes, that's the one. Uh, basically, uh, the first uh, uh, remarks that I would made is that uh, quality infrastructure in the EU is uh, s uh, something based on trust, on the responsibility of the manufacturers and on market surveillance. So that means that uh, uh, we leave to the manufacturer the responsibility of his own uh, product. But of course, uh, we uh, have a working market surveillance and in these uh, circumstances, it has proven essential to have a well-functioning market surveillance and also a, a very good exchange between member states so that they could exchange uh, information on, uh, uh, on products that were not uh, safe, safe enough. Uh, the second point is that standardization in Europe is based on public-private partnership. That means that uh, we have uh, a continuous dialogue with uh, Sensanella Canetzi, 
uh, and we uh, we support them and in in exchange they support us uh, one of the main uh, feature of the standardization in Europe, especially when the standards are used in, um, in regulation, is in legislation, is that uh, uh, standards, European standards are hardly ever uh, mandatory. Everything is voluntary. So if the, the manufacturer decides to use another standard or another things to uh, comply with the essential requirements of our, of our legislation, it can do so. And in every legislation, there is a chapter describing if the manufacturer does not want to use what we call harmonized standards, uh, which are European standards, often uh, international, so ISO or IEC. And uh, uh, these standards, if they are not, if they are used, they give presumption of conformity to the legislation. That means that the manufacturers knows that by using that standards, it comply with the European legislation. Of course, that's an easy way of compliance, but that doesn't uh, imply that the manufacturer is obliged uh, to, to do it. Then we had our big shock when COVID uh, happened and basically all the global supply chain was, uh, was touched and exceptional circumstances call for exceptional uh, responses. So as I said, for quality infrastructure, we had uh, to, as, as European Union, we had to intervene on a, on a lot of uh, different fronts. The first one was a free movement of goods that I touched uh, briefly before. So basically we negotiated with uh, all the member states some sort of green corridors where um, the, the free movement of goods and especially of goods that were uh, essential to the, the COVID-19 crisis uh, were established and uh, one of the requirement was that uh, there should be no more than quarter of an hour queue at the borders and I must say this worked it was uh, one of the first weeks uh, I mean in in Belgium we started teleworking on the 16th of March and by the 23rd uh, basically this uh, this corridor were were established and they are still uh, working very well if you put on the next slide Yes, uh, basically, uh, so we had, uh, uh, we had a problem on quality and we had a problem on standards. Uh, let me start with, uh, with the one that I, that I uh, know the least, which is uh, the conformity assessment issues. Basically, um, we decided, uh, I think, mid of March, there was a communication of the European Commission and the council basically um, recommending to, for, uh, to several things. One of the things was uh, to, um, sorry. Uh, one of the things was uh, to, uh, to try to make, make it possible for uh, um, personal protective equipment or medical devices equipment uh, to be ex exchanged and uh, within the European Union, but also trying to, um, to limit a bit the, the possibility of European countries to sell these uh, PPEs abroad. So, for example, we recommended notified bodies to prioritize testing for uh, PPE and medical devices for COVID-19 and publishing some guidelines for the conformity assessment. Um, one of the main uh, feature of the recommendation of the communication from the European Commission of March was to allow uh, temporarily um, the circulation of uh, PPEs and medical devices, which are not necessarily CE marked and uh, tested according to European standards, but we refer to the WHO uh, recommendation and uh, uh, decided that if the market surveillance authorities in one member state decided that uh, the non, let's say, non-conform uh, masks uh, are on uh, on the field. It would be it would be allowed for them to circulate within the the single market, and this was to sort of control uh, on one side keep the control on what is uh, uh, distributed in the single market, 
while at the same time allowing for more PPEs to be, uh, to be circulated. You probably have read, read everywhere in the news that uh, a lot of firms have uh, reconverted to prepare and uh, manufacture PPE. And uh, to help them doing that, uh, basically, one of the first things that we did was to uh, check with Sen, with Sen and Senelec uh, if some standards for wearable uh, protective equipment could be made available for free. And I must say the response was uh, was pretty quick. And uh, uh, now you can uh, you can download freely uh, from the national standardization bodies websites because Sen and Senelec do not uh, do not sell standards but uh, the national standardization body do. So for, uh, I think it's, it's a list of uh, up to 15 uh, different standards for the personal protective equipment and the medical devices one uh, that are freely downloadable, mostly also in the national languages. And uh, uh, at the same time, we also try to push through because uh, to become a harmonized standard. So to, to give the presumption of conformity to European legislation, a standard has to be formally approved by the European Commission. And, uh, uh, and this, of course, uh, is, um, is a process that can be lengthy. But in this case, we were incredibly fast. I think in one week or 10 days, everything was, uh, was passed through. And so there was a new list of harmonized standards for medical uh, devices, and their reference was published in the official journal. So um, now, for example, one of the things that is not there yet is that now in Europe we have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, homemade uh, reusable masks uh, with, um, with this, uh, a pocket for, uh, for inserting a filter. And uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, some member states have started preparing their own uh, guidelines on how to make them. And, uh, and now we would like to, to take this project uh, uh, at a European level, but this is still under uh, still under negotiations with uh, with Sen and Senelec. Uh, but I will say that, uh, that this pandemic has really uh, showed us the importance of uh, uh, cooperation between uh, the different standardization body, between the different national administration, and also between uh, the, the European Commission and, uh, and all our stakeholders. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Silvia, to, for the insight on what the EU has been doing, and uh, I think uh, the, uh, very important is also what can come, especially for uh, the, the, the smaller groups. Uh, uh, again, uh, your presentation also shows that in the medical the higher technology end, there is a, a lot of standardization, but a lot of demand also uh, to ensure safety uh, from uh, communities and people. And meeting the demand of, of, of the, and the needs of people, of consumers, we have certainly the specific needs of, of women. And I think Lorenza wants to talk uh, with us about that. Uh, we, we, she has been spearheading the gender initiative. So from your observation, Lorenza, why and how the gender needs to be considered in the uh, standardization of PP? Thank you, Bernardo. So I'll go straight into it and uh, please uh, uh, show the next slide already. So uh, uh, my first point is that uh, personal protective equipment, uh, uh, not just in the medical sector, but across all sectors, really penalizes women in many ways. First of all, uh, poorly fitting PPE can lead to injuries. For example, uh, police women uh, lament that their vests do not fit and result in exposure to attacks. Wrong shoes, uh, wrongly sized shoes or overalls can increase the, the chances of tripping or uh, ill-fitting gloves lead to problems in gripping and that de decreases the productivity. And it also strains employer-employee relationships because women uh, complain about, uh, rightly so, of course, uh, about these problems. And uh, it may even lead to permanent uh, bodily damage uh, when it is in use for a long term and uh, even uh, creating issues from uh, ranging up to foot deformities. And I have taken these examples from a survey 
that was carried out by a trade union in the UK uh, with more than 3,000 responders, which overall said that um, PPE sometimes or significantly hampered the work of 57% of, of the women responding. And in particular sectors, the percentage of uh, poorly fitting PPE was a lot higher, uh, rising up to 82%. Next slide. So uh, now coming to the medical uh, sector, uh, the vast majority of workers in this sector are women. And according to an analysis of 140, uh, 104 countries by the WHO, uh, there were about 70% of women uh, on the front line. And uh, these women uh, lament that uh, masks and shields are ill-adapted to the shape of their face and that leads to a lack of adherence of the mask or the goggles to, to the contours and it can lead to exposure to the virus. Gowns are often too big and again there is a risk of tripping or uh, the gown can touch the floor which may be wet and unsanitary. Then there is the complaint on use of overalls rather than trousers and blouse that makes women unable to take sanitary breaks. And overall, we have very little uh, data uh, on the impact that this has on women. But there is one data that I managed to find from Spain, where it says that the infection rates were significantly higher among women health workers than among men, with a percentage of 29% of uh, women that have been um, uh, contracted the virus versus 11% of men. Now, I think the fault is not all with the standards. It's also, in a sense, the poor sensitivity of the um, health uh, industry to this issue. And this uh, image that I put there uh, kind of summarizes this. You know, you wouldn't put the extra small uh, uh, size up on the top of the shelf when the colleague who is uh, smaller size will not be able to reach it. So what I mean with this picture is really to say that uh, uh, the issue is, uh, is nuanced. So there is one issue with the standards, there is one issue also with the culture of, uh, of the place itself. Next slide. I'll uh, um, uh, then uh, want to call attention especially then to the standards. And if we look at the European uh, standards which are based on ISO standard, when you look, for example, here, the example is a uh, standard on gowns and all the figures that are reproduced in the standard are all male figures. There are very few female figures uh, and they're uh, not in the minimal requirements, but they're in the other possibilities. So they're not, uh, they're not as prominent. And uh, that's particularly perplexing when you realize that 70% of the workers in this sector are women. So why is this not, uh, the, at, at least at the same level as the male figures on these, uh, on these uh, standards? And uh, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll go quickly as I realize that I'm already at the end of my five minutes. So next slide. And uh, uh, this is uh, exactly the kind of issues that we have been uh, tackling under the UNEC Gender Responsive Standards Initiative, which was set up in 2016, bringing together a very diverse group of stakeholders with the objective of integrating a gender lens in standards and standards development and strengthening the use of standards for SDG 5. The declaration uh, that uh, this uh, uh, initiative uh, developed was opened just one year ago yesterday to uh, signatories and we already have almost 70 uh, now um, and these uh, standards bodies are really from all sectors uh, and from all countries from all regions. So I think uh, this is uh, the last of my slides and I'll stop here. Oh, there's one more. Uh, well, I think uh, I think we'll stop here for uh, allowing a little bit more time for question and answers. Yes. Uh, appreciate so much, uh, Lorenza. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And 
And yes, uh, I think this COVID-19 crisis has shown the, the gender divide, not only in the standardization world, but in, 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 in the lockdown, we have uh, heard so many challenges in the unemployment, in the households, and, and so much more. We could have a full discussion on, on the challenges, and a lot is going on in order to address uh, this. But thank you for uh, sharing uh, from the perspective of standardization and PTEs, uh, what can also be done uh, through the initiative to address uh, these issues. And last but not least, we will uh, uh, move to uh, uh, Marcel uh, from uh, Senegal in Cote d'Ivoire to listen to uh, the conformity assessment that uh, uh, is not existing probably in relation to, to PPEs. So the, the question is, how can a conformity assessment uh, uh, mechanism uh, deployed quickly uh, to respond to the new need. There is a new need. There, there was no conformity ass assessment. Uh, I imagine also not in the, in the region, but I see from the questions also uh, from the India region, we are hearing some questions about uh, that. So how can we uh, meet this need to ensure that the customers have uh, more secure PPE, that we can build the necessary trust? Marcel, please don't forget your mic. Thank you, Bernardo. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I have uh, listed in all the discussion. I think that conformity assessment body is is in the, is a challenge for this pandemic. Uh, we have tried to notice two big situations. Uh, you have these countries, uh, these developed countries, where you have a very strong conformity assessment mechanism. I mean, you have accreditation laboratories accredited laboratories, accredited certification bodies and inspection, and also you have the AB, the accreditation body in place. So the, the AB should be a signatory of the international uh, organization like uh, ILAC and IIF. And also you have the situation B, where you have developing countries with an uh, insufficient number of laboratories, inspection bodies and certification, a small number of accredited uh, conformity assessment body, and sometimes you have no acquisition body, or the body is not yet recognized internationally. So this is a challenge for these, these, these countries, because at the end of the day, please next, next uh, what? yeah, thank you. At the end of the day, what we would like to have is just that testing, I mean, the labs, the inspection bodies, and all the uh, certification bodies should be uh, accredited by accreditation bodies and, and, and rely on the international system, uh, which is supervised by uh, IIF and, uh, and, uh, and ILAC, ILAC for the labs. So uh, this is what we need to have at the end of the day to be sure that the end user can be safe when using all these PPEs. Please, next, next slide. Uh, so what, what we have noted during this, this pandemic is the fact that even if uh, whether it be the case uh, A or the case B, as it was say uh, previously, it was a challenge to, to allow uh, the end user to have complete PPEs uh, because uh, all of a sudden you have an explosion in demand for these PPEs and how the uh, conformity uh, assessment mechanism can react to this situation. Uh, uh, we have this, this discussion about the CE type. As you were saying, it is a responsibility of the producers, but since uh, the, you can have business opportunities, sometimes we are not sure that we, we can rely on uh, uh, all the conformity assessment mechanism as it should be done on if it is not a situation of, of crisis. So uh, in the case B, I mean, in the developing countries, it's quite the same because the, of the fact that the mechanism is quite, uh, the conformity assessment mechanism is quite uh, young, uh, you have a, a high risk to have at the end of the day non-compliant non uh, uh, PPEs, uh, specifically masks to the end user. So how can we address this situation? Uh, next slide, please. So I think that we have uh, many uh, possibilities, but I would like to highlight two of them. The first is the certification system. It could be uh, voluntary or, or, or mandatory. 
But what is interesting with the certification is the fact that you can at least try to master the local producers. As you were saying, a lot of companies have shifted their activities to be able to, 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 to work on uh, the production of PPEs. And uh, for example, here in West Africa, we are working hard on how to quickly help the local producers to, to be able to uh, deploy it in, uh, quality management system based on uh, international standards on, uh, on the PPEs, but uh, for product certification. At least since uh, it's, it's, it's quite difficult now to import uh, these PPEs from, uh, from abroad because of the, the shortage. So I think that this is one of the way that can uh, able to, to ensure that at the end of the day, the end user could uh, have uh, uh, safe, safe uh, PPEs. Next slide, please. Uh, the, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, second solution was developed uh, mainly in uh, developing countries because they were aware of the fact that they do not have uh, a strong conformity assessment mechanism. So uh, we have what we call the, uh, the VOC, which is the verification of conformity. Uh, this is a pre-export verification carried out by uh, strong uh, inspection bodies, with, uh, which rely on a very strong network of, of, of accredited labs. And the purpose is that before you ship the goods, and specifically the PPEs and the masks to the countries, it should be tested uh, before. Uh, and what we have as advantages is the fact that you will not uh, have the ban goods in your countries. You will not have to supervise the cost for the destruction. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you have a system to try to master what is coming from abroad in this, uh, in, in this pandemic. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I will say that we can have these two uh, approaches that are quite interesting. Uh, for example, here in, uh, in West Africa, countries are working uh, days and nights to have to put, to put in place uh, a certification uh, system uh, to be able to, to, to master the local suppliers. Uh, I was saying that uh, we, we are relying on uh, very artisan tailors and so on and so on. So it means that at least you need standards, you, you need to have a quality system in place. And concerning the abroad uh, product, uh, we, I have noticed that many countries have added the, the PPEs on the list of uh, uh, products that need to be, uh, to have this uh, verification, verification of uh, conformity certificate. So at the end of the day, with these two approaches, you can have at least uh, uh, some good, uh, some safe and compliant uh, PPEs, uh, like masks that uh, the end user can use. Uh, thank you, Leonardo. And, and, and thank you for, for, for uh, all the panelists for sharing their views. And, and, and also for, for keeping the time that leads us to, to some uh, minutes at least to, to have some questions. And, and, and one that is a recurrent is, is more uh, how this is affecting the population and the communities. And uh, I, I hope uh, Mr. Liu can help us to, 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 to address this issue because it's not so much on, on medical masks, but how long is it recommended to use a mask per day? I don't know if you would have some response to this question, uh, Mr. Liu. Uh, uh, sorry, this, uh, uh, this is uh, quite a complicated uh, uh, question because different, uh, different products have different uh, recommended uh, use of time. Uh, for the uh, for the mask that we use for industrial use, let's say commonly they have a lifespan of about eight hours, and for the surgical masks or the or the medical masks, they are just uh, they should be disposed uh, disposed if you take them off. So uh, quite different stories. And uh, uh, during our time of uh, fighting against the coronavirus, I think that. Uh, for the surgical mask or the medical mask, we uh, basically use this for six hours. It's, it, it, 
uh, and from the the resistance, uh, the arising of the resistance, all the all the testing of the filter efficiency, we have to say that uh, most of the uh, uh, medical mask can serve the their duties, but I'm not sure for for other products because because it's quite a uh, uh, material related uh, property. So yeah. They, they have to follow the instruction of the manufacturers, not uh, from the, uh, I, I say from me or from uh, others. They have to, to get the information from their manufacturer. So, yeah. Another question that we, we receive uh, is uh, uh, related to developing countries and how developing countries and their population can, can cope and guide their populations because uh, in many countries, also in Africa, uh, uh, many people started to produce the mask, but how to guide them to produce them in a proper manner. So eventually uh, w w there is a need for, for, for some guidance that can be provided. It, it, it would standards be the right tool to, to address this issue? Uh, do you have some response to this important question, Marcel? Uh, what would be your take? Thank you, thank you so much, Bernardo. I think this is a key issue, and uh, presently we are working uh, with the support of UNIDO in this, in the ECOWAS region, because we need uh, absolutely to have standards to address this issue. And uh, what is uh, being done is that we are, for example, for MASK, uh, the region is working uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a standard that could be adopted at uh, the level of the ECOWAS mission and uh, to help the, 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 uh, the, the tailors uh, locally to be able to produce the mask. What is also in interesting is we need to have training because I was saying that this is not very big companies, very small company, we have SMEs, very small companies. So they need to be, to be guided. And it's why after the standards, we, are, we would like to have also a leaflet, uh, uh, the training tools, some short movies, in the local language so that we are sure that the, the, all these small uh, producers can be able to, to uh, be involved in the business of, uh, of uh, this production, but at least uh, with the respect of, uh, of all these, these standards. Uh, also what is done is that uh, we have tried to check what is the availability of, uh, of labs uh, in, the, in, the, in the region and the, and the technology. So, so that we can at least uh, be able to do some 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 test, uh, a minimum test to be sure that uh, the, the the product is is fine for the for the end users. So I think that we have many challenges, and uh, one of the issue is to, to to rely on standardization with all the member states, but also using the cooperation that. We have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I, I have two questions here that uh, are looking more into the future. And then the, 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 the easier one is, 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 is uh, basically related to the EU policy and what will happen after. Will it be maintained? Uh, how do you see uh, moving it to the future uh, in, in terms of standardization? How long will these uh, policies of freeing be the, 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 uh, giving the standards for free supporting production will last. Uh, is there a lessons that we can see into the future? And just uh, just to 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 to, to uh, early one, uh, Ms. Yinping, the other question relates also to the future. What role can take uh, the WTO, uh, the WTO, sorry, in terms of standardization? Will they take a lead? Uh, is there a role to, to take the lead? So uh, two, a bit, I think, uh, related questions, how we can forge uh, cooperation in this regard in harmonization in the future. Well, you. As you know, standards are copyrighted materials. So uh, we, we are very grateful to the standardization body that uh, gave us uh, their availability to lose some income in order for, for the common goods. But, um, I, I would see uh, some sort of mechanism to face uh, uh, pandemics and face crises like the COVID-19 in the future for sure. So this time we had to start from scratches. So we will definitely probably uh, have a talk with Sensenelec and Etsy and see if this 
kind of a response could be um, could be triggered in a in a, in a quicker way without having to go back to negotiations like we did this time. However, um, I also uh, am a firm believer on of the business model that the standardization body have. So if they their uh, their liability depends on the on the sale sell of standards on the sale of standards. Obviously, uh, we cannot uh, take that mm -hmm. away unless we modify uh, the business model. For example, in, in, in Europe, Etsy, which is the ICT standardization body, uh, its deliverables are all free. But, uh, of course, uh, there is a, a price to pay uh, uh, in, uh, in part for participating to the standardization. So, as a, a colleague from the Australian standardization body once told me, is that uh, someone somewhere has to pay. Thank <laughs> <Okay>. you. <laughs> Indeed, this, 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 is, this is the point that uh, standardization takes a, a big effort. Consensus building uh, does not go for free. Uh, it's hard to work and it requires to be financed and therefore it is an important public investment uh, that needs to uh, uh, to, to be provided because the common work is very important for that. It helps everybody. And Ms. Uh, 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 uh would you uh, take the question on uh, how the WHO would be working in the future in, in, in relation to developing standards? Uh, and, uh, is there some possibility that there is a strong leadership in, in, in this regard? Yes, there are several groups um, within WHO that are initiating rapid research um, studies uh, to look at eventually uh, triggering a kind of standardization process through um, the normal mechanisms. Um, it's really more uh, right now of a question of evidence-based gathering, um, doing the proper research studies. Uh, there, I will point to the preferred product characteristics for personal protective equipment that was uh, published in 2018. This lists 10 criteria for the ideal PPE, for healthcare PPE especially. From those, we could envision that each of those loose characteristics could be tied to standards that measure um, how well uh, the PPE of the future could um, meet the criteria necessary for healthcare-related PPE. Um, so it's a long road. Uh, WHO takes on um, a research uh, perspective and initiating or uh, proposing research studies that um, hopefully will be taken on later uh, once it's in the public domain by the standards organizations to then uh, formalize that into a, a standard. It is a long road, so <laughs> I can't say that there's anything in the short term that will give you that answer. Um, but um, there's a lot of research that's taking place some of those projects are three months. Um, they have a three-month time, timeline. Several of them are proposed for three months. So this is very rapid research. Um, and uh, it's the time now to gather the evidence and really focus on PPE, uh, what kind of PPE is being used in the field, what is um, uh, protective uh, for healthcare workers, um, and um, just uh, making sure that, that, that uh, those uh, baby steps, those um, first steps are, are taken. So that's how I would respond. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, I, I, I learned that we are over time. Uh, we need to bring it to an end. Still, I would like uh, maybe Lorenza to give the floor to just uh, to address uh, the, the issue of training. You have been working on education. And then I will also turn directly to the end to, towards uh, Lorena, who has also been working on our knowledge and training. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Lorenza, please, Mike. Thank you. I will just make a very short point. I appreciate it very much, all the discussion, and especially Marcel was, uh, was, uh, was pointing us to the need for uh, capacity building. And I'd like to say it's not only capacity building about standards related to PPE, it's also capacity building more generally about how to face risks how to uh, manage continuity, how to manage emergency. Because uh, uh, if we don't have those basic competencies, uh, then uh, uh, learning about uh, how to make uh, masks, how to wear masks is ever so important, but it only is going to take us part of the way. So thank you once more. 
Thank you so much. And with this, I would like to give the floor back to, to Dorina to mention also something about training and the knowledge app eventually to close. In the meantime, I would like to thank you so much. It was great uh, having you around in this discussion. And as usual, when we start really getting into the subject, we, we need to close, but certainly we will continue uh, making sure that we collaborate in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernardo. Indeed, um, please, for, uh, we have a platform for online training, which is the TII Knowledge Hub. I mentioned um, the link before, it's tii.unido.org. There we do have some uh, trainings which are self-paced and everybody can take um, upon their own availability. We are constantly working to expand um, our training offer. So we are very interested to hear also results from these kind of discussions, what is the interest and um, which direction we should work in the future. Um, in general, I would also like to thank everybody for a very successful participation. We got a lot of questions through the Q&A box. Thank you for all um, who posed the question. Thank you for the panelists who answered them. I'm sorry that we did not manage to answer all of the questions. We are always constrained by time, um, but we still hope it was a fruitful discussion for everybody. As promised, we will make the recordings available. Um, please again, have a look at the tii.unido.org for more information um, during the next week. And uh, having said that, I would like to officially close the session. Thank you everybody for having been here with us today and we look forward to see you um, in one of our future webinars maybe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice weekend. Yes. Nice weekend, <laughs> yes.